Veen, um, at this late hour, but as you can imagine, um, Mr Sharp, we've been doing our best to get straight answers out of Qantas. Anyway, I now uh, welcome the Honourable John Sharp, AM, Deputy Chairman of Rex Group via video conference. I understand information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses giving evidence to Senate committees has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, my name is John Sharp and I'm the Deputy Chairman of Rex Airlines. Thank you, uh, Mr Sharp. Now, we do have Rex's comprehensive submission. Um, I would invite you to make a short opening statement and then uh, we've got a range of questions. OK, well, look, thank you very much, uh, Senator McKenzie, and to the other senators. Um, uh, I'm uh, just going to give a brief uh, um, opening statement and I look forward to your questions. Uh, uh, Rex has been delivering air services to regional Australia for more than 20 years. Uh, during that time, we've developed an extensive network across Australia of more than 60 destinations at its peak. We've achieved this by driving costs down, using our economies of scale and translating that into more affordable airfares, thereby increasing passenger numbers, which in turn leads to more frequencies. And of course, more frequencies results in more convenience, which res attracts more passengers as a consequence. We, we call this our virtu vir virtuous cycle. As a result of Rex's approach, dozens of regional towns across Australia have reliable air services. Qantas was, has been happy to tolerate this situation in the past, as they did not want to focus on smaller ports with their higher cost operations. Qantas was content to compete with Rex on eight ports, um, that generally have more than 100,000 passengers per annum. Under this competitive environment, Rex was not only able to bring air services to many ports that would never have an air service otherwise, but we were able to manage to generate profits during that period for about 17 years up to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And despite making those profits, um, we generally didn't pay a dividend to our shareholders because we used the money that we would have otherwise paid for dividends to strengthen our business and build up our financial position. All of, the, the, all of this changed, however, when Rex decided to enter the domestic airline market in 2022. We announced our decision in November 22, uh, 20, I should say. Qantas uh, is prepared to tolerate um, weaker um, airlines like, uh, like Virgin, who have a, a relatively small share of the market, but they see, I think, in the form of Rex coming into the market, Rex as being much more efficient, and they saw that as a danger to their own business in the domestic airline market. And they saw that as, an, uh, as perhaps um, helping to destroy their quasi-monopolistic hold on the domestic market. Qantas then decided to destroy Rex's regional business because it knows that Rex needs this base to launch and compete in the domestic market. Qantas then entered into small regional routes that they had never shown any interest mm -hmm. in pre-COVID, routes that could hardly sustain one operator right in the middle of the shutdowns of COVID when Qantas everywhere else in their system was reducing frequencies and closing down services. Rex made two complaints about Qantas's behaviour to the ACCC, which we have included in our submission, which you referred to today. The ACCC spent about a year investigating them using external advisers, but sadly decided they did not want to take the risk of going to court. And as a result of Qantas's predatory behaviour, Rex's regional operations suffered a loss of around $30 million a year, as we predicted in our submission to the ACCC at the time. As a result of that, Rex has announced cuts and reductions to more than a dozen ports in an effort to reduce our losses. And we only made an announcement just a few days ago. And I, I give this as an example of one of the ways Qantas behaves in a so-called competitive airline market. But it's their, their behaviour is designed to restrict competition, not to encourage it. And I want to give two further very brief examples of their behaviour uh, in, in designed to restrict competition. 
and the, the, the second is the second example is is hoarding of slots which has been referred to quite regularly over the last few weeks which limits our ability to and anyone else's ability to operate more services at Sydney Airport and the third example is by taking our pilots from our regional fleet in about the last 12 months we've lost 37 per cent of our pilots in our regional fleet the bulk of those have gone to Qantas this means we can't operate our services and hence reduce frequencies or cut out services to some ports in our national network. And I just wanted to add to my original opening remarks by just making a couple of references to things I've listened to today, if you would uh, give me the indulgence to do that, Senator. Um, one was in reference to the fact that Qantas claims it has the best on-time performance and the lowest cancellation rates. Normally, um, when the previous CEO made that claim, he would refine it by saying of the major airlines or, the domestic com or their domestic competitors. Today, they didn't add that qualification in. But those, that qualification is designed to cut out wrecks from their, um, their consideration uh, for on-time performance. Rex at the moment is the best on-time performance of any of the airlines in Australia. We have the lowest cancellation rates by a substantial margin. I wanted to make that point. And I also heard uh, it stated today that Rex got 108 slots at Sydney Airport, all that we needed. Um, I don't know where the figure of 108 comes from. We can't work out where that comes from. But we certainly didn't get the slots that we need to do the job that we would like to do operating out of Sydney Airport. And I could ex elaborate, expand on that a little bit more if you'd like to ask me those questions later. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you about the Rex trained uh, pilots. Do you have some suggestions on what the government could actually do to resolve this issue? We're hearing um, that there's nothing that can be done until after the white paper's released, but is this something that the government could actually um, make a decision in? Yeah, look. We train our own pilots. We've got two um, flying academies, pilot training academies, one in Wagga, can accommodate up to nearly 200 students, and another one in Ballarat, uh, nearly the same size. We run our own cadet programs, um, and we put an enormous effort into training pilots, not only for our own needs, but also we train pilots from other airlines. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, we don't see that duplicated by other airlines. Virgin doesn't have a, tri a pilot training f uh, function, doesn't have a cadet program. Qantas uh, lends its name to a, um, a flying training academy in Toowoomba, uh, but it doesn't fund it. It doesn't provide or guarantee jobs for those people who go through it. Uh, we often get people who Absolutely. come through that program applying for jobs with Rex. So we've, we, as a result, are the only ones who genuinely run a cadet program and train pilots for our own needs. Unfortunately, they get taken from us and we are left with a situation like we've just seen in the last 12 months or so, where we have lost 37% of our pilots, mostly to Qantas, and, and we are therefore unable to run our schedule. We can't do the frequencies, we can't operate to the ports. What I, would, what I think there's a number of things you could do um, some countries um, uh, uh, require airlines who take pilots off another airline to pay a transfer fee, oh, okay. and, and that's one thing you could do. And the second thing you could possibly look at, is, and you could do it very quickly and easily, is you could actually uh, require airlines to invest in their future by training their own pilots <laughs> rather than pinching everybody else's pilots. And that's something government could do could do it very quickly. Um, if we have to wait for the white paper, which I suspect won't be till towards the end of next year, we'll have lost a lot of pilots mm. and we will be further reducing our frequencies and services in regional Australia. Thank you, Mr Sharp. Um, uh, Senator Babette, do you have any questions? Yes, I've just got a couple of quick questions. So, Mr Sharp, obviously you've, you've been talking about um, the major carriers, the Qantas group, poaching your pilots. How many pilots have they poached? What's the percentage? Uh, it's 37%. Um, most of the, uh, the, the largest port, 37% of our pilots have gone from the regional fleet in the last uh, year or so. 
And the sad part about that, Senator, is that the majority of those are captains. And uh, as we train cadets through our flying academies in Wagga and Ballarat, they come out as first officers, but it takes four to five years to train them up to be a captain. And so when you lose a captain, you've got a long lag factor mm. before you can replace them for within your own resources. And so it's a significant problem for us. And it, I don't think it's, it's fair or reasonable that the one and only airline in Australia that actually does the right thing and trains its own pilots, invests in its own future, suffers because other airlines don't bother to invest in their future and don't train their own pilots. Right, right. So, Mr Sharp, now you've accused Qantas of, you know, acting like a bully, quote-unquote, towards the smaller players in the aviation business. Now, can you just elaborate on, on what you mean by that? Well, I've said that a number of times in interviews, and, and I, I believe it. I mean, Qantas is, I think it was one of the other senators, Senator White might have been, the person talked about them being tough. I would describe them as being bullies. <laughs> and they're bullies because they do things like I've just described. They will go into some of these very small regional routes uh, to punish us because we had the temerity to go into the domestic airline market. Um, and, and, and they did this during the middle of COVID. And I heard it said a number of times today that Qantas does things for commercial reasons only. It's the only reason they do it. They welcome competition and they do things for commercial reasons. Well, Qantas announced a whole heap of new regional destinations that they would serve during COVID. And I'll just go through some of them. Um, Adelaide to Mount Gambia, um, they announced they would be flying to. And in the, at the time that they decided to do that, we had in, that, in, in the month they started, we had 1,286 passengers in that market, and they were going to put a second operator into that. If you go to Melbourne, Mount Gambia, they had 134 passengers. That's what the whole market was, not just shared between Qantas and, and, and Rex, 134 passengers for the whole month from Melbourne to Mount Gambia. Melbourne to Wagga, they had 152 passengers in that market, and now being serviced by two operators. Melbourne to Albury, 210 passengers in that market. Mm -hmm. um, would you... Would you, if you were running an airline like Qantas, would you deploy an aircraft that's worth 20 odd million US dollars with all those crews and backup services into a market that has 134 or 210 or 417 passengers for the month? Mm. That's not a commercial judgment in my view, but that's exactly what Qantas did. And they did it into routes that they'd never shown any interest in until we announced that we were going to move into the domestic airline market. And that's what I refer to as bullying. I think it's very aggressive behaviour. It certainly isn't, um, it isn't uh, commercial because you can't make money out of that and they, of course, would have lost money in those routes. And that's the sort of behaviour that we've been subjected to over the last few years. Seems very uncompetitive to me now. <laughs> You've made um, several complaints to the ACCC regarding Qantas and, uh, it, to me, it doesn't appear like they've received appropriate consideration... Um, can you share with the committee just a couple of examples of those complaints? Well, we use the um, predatory behaviour by uh, dumping excess capacity into these regional routes, Senator. We referred that, that example to the ACCC. Now, to be fair to the ACCC, they took the matter seriously. They employed external advisers at considerable cost to the ACCC. They spent nearly a year working on it, and I heard today from Mr Finch that they didn't find one single example. Well, I don't think that's a fair reflection of what actually happened. What I think was the problem that the ACCC faced was that they weren't prepared to take the risk mm -hmm. of taking this to court, because they know that if the ACCC takes Qantas to court, Qantas will throw resources at it with an unlimited budget whereas the ACCC has a limited budget. They'll bring in the best legal people, the biggest legal team, they'll have consultants to assist them, and they will make it very difficult for the ACCC with a limited budget to be able to act, uh, um, uh, successfully uh, prosecute the case through the courts. So the ACCC has to be more than 100% sure they're going to win before they take on Qantas because of the resources and the behaviour, the aggressive behaviour that Qantas often takes in these matters. 
and as a result, they didn't go ahead and take the matter to court. Um, Mr Sharp, just one final question. It's very clear that Qantas is potentially abusing its market power, shall we say. What do you think the government can do to curb that? Well, one of the ways you can uh, curb the market power is by, um, by doing things like uh, addressing the slot system at Sydney Airport. We all understand mm. that Qantas is warding slots at Sydney Airport. They abuse the 80-20 rule. Um, and in their own um, media statement just recently, the head of international and domestic services, Andrew David, said that Qantas actually uses only 90% of the slots they have at Sydney Airport. So that, you know, if you wanted, if you wanted to, to create more competition and say, let Bonds have some slots, let Rex have the slots that it would like to have, let some international airline operators into Sydney to create more economic activity, well, you could take away 10% of Qantas' slots tomorrow and you wouldn't affect Qantas's operations, and yet you'd free up 10% of the movements at Sydney Airport for new competition. That would be a simple way. What I would suggest, though, is that you probably take away 20% of Qantas's um, slots at Sydney Airport as punishment for the way they've been hoarding them over the last few years, and you would say to, to the uh, Airport Coordination Authority that Qantas can't apply for new slots at Sydney Airport for another three years. And that would be one way of uh, punishing uh, an airline that's been hoarding and, uh, slots, abusing the 80-20 rule. But it would also be a way of, of, of getting competition into the Australian market. Sydney Airport is the biggest airline market in Australia. We've just heard today that Qantas welcomes competition. Um, well, this is a great way of welcoming competition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr Sharp. That's it for me, Chair. Thanks. A uh, great question there, Senator Babbitt. Um, I was going to go to guilty of slot hoarding at Sydney Airport. It's been an issue that the committee has traversed with some exceptional evidence from uh, both the Canberra Airport and Sydney Airport, um, and recognising it's not just Qantas that's doing the slot hoarding, but Virgin too. Um, Mr Sharp, I know your submission goes in some part to that, but could I ask you on notice um, to review the evidence of both Canberra Airport, uh, which is specifically going to the exceptionally high cancellation rates for Sydney Canberra, um, and also the evidence of the Bris uh, sorry the Sydney Airport uh, CEO, which was which were both scathing of the slot system. Um, and if there's anything you'd like to add. We had um, Peter Harris with us last night, the, the author of that slot review. We also had both previous uh, ACCC commissioners, um, Rod Sims and Alan Fells, who both recommended um, that the government implement the slot review by Peter Harris immediately. Um, what is your view on the time frame of some of those recommendations from uh, Mr Harris's slot review? Well, Mr Harris's slot review uh, was presented uh, to the government uh, more than two years ago, and uh, it's still being considered by government. And uh, Mr Harris was, of course, the person who wrote the original legislation surrounding mm. the establishment of the slot system in Sydney, which was a result of putting in the 80 movements per hour cap into Sydney Airport in 1996. And so he'd be one of the best people in the country to, to review it because he was the person who, if you like, um, wrote it and gave birth to it. So um, Mr uh, Harris makes some sensible recommendations, one of which is that cancellations should be audited to ensure that airlines are not abusing the 80-20 rule. And um, and that, uh, I think, is a very simple and easy mechanism that you can put into place, and it would effectively um, stop the hoarding of uh, slots into Sydney Airport overnight. That would be one thing I would do. And the, the, the evidence of this, Senator, is, is, is as clear as day. I mean, I've heard um, Stephen Barron from Canberra Airport uh, uh, talking about the cancellation rates on that particular route between Sydney and Canberra 
They're extraordinary. I think I've heard figures of up to 15% cancellations on the mm. Sydney-Canberra route. Mm. But you look at the Sydney-Melbourne route, which is our busiest route in Australia, and the cancellation rates there are quite extraordinary. For, you know, if you're looking at last year's cancellations rate, last financial year's cancellations rate, Qantas cancelled 9.8% of their flights between Sydney and Melbourne. Um, the Jetstar cancelled 13.9% of their flights between right. Sydney and Melbourne. Rex operating exactly the same aircraft on exactly the same route in exactly the same weather conditions with exactly the same air traffic control problems cancelled 2.8% of our flights on that route. Why is it that Qantas Jetstar, the Qantas group, have cancellation rates that are multiples of that? The tr well, what, truth would you, of what would your... What would your why do you think that looks like that, so, such a differential? Well, because Qantas is clearly uh, trying to maximise the number of, of, of cancellations so that they can keep just within the 80-20 rule. I mean, you're allowed to, under the existing rules, you're allowed to cancel up to 20% of the flights in a particular slot without losing the slot. And, uh, uh, and uh, what Qantas is doing is making sure that they cancel up to that 20% so that they get to keep the slot. Nobody else has access to the slot, but they remain within the rules by cancelling up to that amount. That's what they're effectively doing. And so are they, gaming, you... are they gaming the system? Are they gaming the regulatory framework that's in place? Absolutely. Um, you know, th this, it was never meant to be gamed like this. The, the original intent of the legislation that created the slot system was that to give airlines some wriggle room for cancellations that were beyond their control, whether, whether genuine you know, maintenance problems and so forth. It was to give them some wriggle room. Well, 20 per cent has proven to be far too big. Uh, and I've often said in the past we shouldn't have gone 80-20, we should have gone 90-10 or something like that. But at the very least, we should be auditing them to ensure that um, airlines are not abusing the system. But the way I would, I would do it, I would just simply say, to, say, well, Qantas, you've already admitted you don't need 10% of the slots that you've currently been allocated, so we'll take those off you and put them in the pool. And as a penalty, we'll take another 10% off uh, to send a message that people should not abuse the system. Uh, one of my good friend and colleague, Senator Orman Payne, suggested we should raffle some of those slots. <laughs> Well, uh, there'd be plenty of people that'd be prepared to buy a ticket in that raffle, I can assure you. <laughs> in, the slot, right. in the great Sydney slot raffle. Um, we're get, it's getting Sydney late. It's raffle. getting late. Um, so I, I did... Do you believe the government is running a protection racket for Qantas? Good question. Well, um, you know, governments have always looked after Qantas. Um, you know, it's been a, a long-held I mean, long view that Qantas promotes that they are the national carrier. It's worth pointing out that they ceased to be the national carrier many years ago when they were privatised. A national carrier is generally a government-owned airline, but Qantas carries on this imagery that they are the national carrier and that, therefore, they have to be protected so that the national interest aligns with the national carrier's interest. <laughs> and um, my, my view of it is uh, that that's not the case. Um, I, I don't see why Qantas should receive any more benefits than anyone else. I remember some years ago there was an attempt by Qantas, uh, the previous CEO approached the government of the day to have all of Qantas's debts underwritten by the Commonwealth. Thankfully that was rejected. But had it been accepted, it would have meant that Virgin, who had debts, Rex didn't have any debt uh, in those days, we didn't have any debt, it wouldn't have been of any benefit to us, but uh, we argued at the time that if you're going to guarantee one, underwrite one company's debts, you've got to underwrite the rest of ours because mm. you can't compete. It, you know, Virgin couldn't compete against Qantas if Virgin's debts weren't underwritten, but Qantas's were. So I think, I think governments have protected Qantas for, and, and there have been many attempts to do it uh, over the years and I, I, I don't feel it's appropriate because it creates an unlevel playing field. Thank you. Um... Has Rex refunded its passengers who could not take their flights as a result of COVID? Uh, yes, we did. All those passengers who requested a refund, of which there were many, uh, got their refund. What, what we did was um, 
we realised very early on in the piece when COVID struck that we had a lot of people who, who couldn't take the flight they'd paid for for reasons beyond their control. And so um, we were inundated in our call centre. Um, even though we expanded our call centre and we brought in a, a contract call centre to help us, we created a portal on our website. It took us a week to, to do it. So we created a portal. You went on our website, you clicked on the portal, you put in your details, bank account, credit card, whatever it was, and you got a refund within three to four working days. We did that very early on in the piece. And it meant that our customers who, uh, who needed a refund got it very quickly. We then wrote to all the travel agents who had booked flights that hadn't been taken and asked them to do the same thing via our system uh, for their customers. And so for everybody who actually sought a refund, we were able to give them one uh, very quickly and very easily via the creation of this portal and by uh, going to all the travel agents and, and urging them to, to become proactive to seek the refunds on behalf of their customers. Which is quite incredible with the evidence that the former CEO, Alan Joyce, was giving about why they were keeping in excess of half a billion dollars of their customers' money on the books, that it was somehow technologically impossible. But little old Rex gets a website up and gets the money out the door in four days. Thank you. Now, you are a former transport minister. You have had the great honour and privilege of dealing with the former national carrier at the pointy end. Um, today we've heard evidence from both the chair, Mr Goida, and the new CEO, Vanessa Hudson, that neither of them have contacted the Prime Minister or the Minister for Transport concerning either the competition review into aviation, the ACCC um, halting its monitoring, or the decision about Qatar Airways. Given your experience of how Qantas operates, do you, do you find that incredible? It's very unusual, um, <laughs> very, very unusual. Oh, it's very because, subtle, very uh, diplomatic, Mr Sharp. Well, when I was in the role of Transport Minister many years ago, uh, Qantas was by far the most active lobbyist. They had a, a very good um, person based here in Canberra in a small office with several people in it. And they were here, there and everywhere at everything that was going in Canberra. And they were always fleeing in your ear about whatever issues of concern they had. The CEO of Qantas in those days, James Strong, the late James Strong, um, was very active with me personally. He would ring me regularly uh, on my mobile phone or at my home, uh, on, particularly on weekends, often on Sunday nights, when there was a fair chance I would be at home. And, um, and he would ring me. And, uh, and they would always ensure that I had invitations to all the things that they felt I would be interested in attending. And there was always an issue they wanted to discuss. So they were far more active than any other um, a company in the transport portfolio, far more active than Ansett, who was relatively inactive during that period. Uh, and so if, as we've heard um, from your description today, that the case is different, then it is very, very different. And I would be surprised to hear that they have changed their methodologies. Is it your understanding, I mean, aviation's quite a small industry, um, that the former CEO, Alan Joyce, um, had the Prime Minister's number on speed dial as a former shadow transport minister and the current minister's uh, as well, if not this new CEO in Ms Hudson. She's only just got her feet under the desk. Um, my understanding, it was quite a cr close personal and political relationship. Is that your understanding of the former CEO with this government? Well, I, I think um, uh, most uh, Qantas CEOs um, you know, go to a lot of trouble to develop a personal relationship. I, <clears throat> I do recall once being in the office of John, uh, who's called Tubby Ward, uh, who was the CEO of Qantas. Not allowed to say that life. anymore, Mr Sharp. Oh, sorry. Well, that was his nickname. That was his nickname. Um, but uh, John Ward had an office in Sydney and I was um, uh, visiting him on one occasion when I was Shadow Minister for Transport and I asked if I could use a phone and he let me um, use his phone on his desk and I noticed he had a number of buttons with names alongside of them 
um, on the side of the telephone, and one of them was the then Minister of Transport, who just obviously pressed that button and you've got through to him. So they've had a very close relationship, always been the case. And of course, <clears throat> if we've had Prime Ministers who are Sydney-based, um, with aircraft noise issues and other issues that affect their electorates, then the Prime Minister of the day, the Transport Minister of the day and the CEO of Qantas will always be talking to each other because there are issues that arise in their electorates that give them a reason to talk to the CEO of Qantas. Thank you, Mr Sharp, and thank you so much for um, hanging in there uh, despite the late hour or early hour, as it may be for you. Um, we really appreciate your evidence. I'm sure there will be questions on notice, um, and uh, we hope you get home soon and safely. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.